So, meine Damen und Herren, äh, wir sollten beginnen. Mein Name ist Christopher Dase ähm, und ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen, auch im Namen von äh, Nicole Deitelhoff und Julian Jung, mit denen ich gemeinsam diese Ringvorlesung für das Wintersemester 2018-19 konzipiert habe. Äh, Rebecca Schmidt wird wahrscheinlich gleich kommen und auch noch ein paar Worte für das Exzellenzcluster sagen. Aber ich will vielleicht äh, schon mal vorweg ein paar Worte darüber äh, verlieren, was unsere Beweggründe für diese Thematik waren. Die Entwicklung des internationalen Systems kann ja als die Differenzierung der Kontrolle politischer Gewalt beschrieben werden. Das Sicherheitsbedürfnis des einzelnen Individuums führte eins zur Entstehung des Staates und seiner vertikalen Differenzierung in hierarchische Institutionen. Nicht wahr? Charles Tilly hat diesen Prozess eindrucksvoll beschrieben. Und dann hat das Sicherheitsbedürfnis der Staaten wiederum zur Entwicklung des internationalen Systems geführt und äh, zu den, zur horizontalen Differenzierung internationaler Institutionen der anarchischen Gesellschaft. Hedley Bull hat darüber sein berühmtes Buch geschrieben. Politische Gewalt wurde so vom Staat und seinen Sicherheitsbehörden im Inland monopolisiert und international durch zwischenstaatliche Institutionen und das Völkerrecht eingehegt. Nun, diese staatszentrierte Konfiguration scheint sich gegenwärtig zu transformieren und mit dieser Transformation, so könnte man sagen, setzt eine Entdifferenzierung der politischen Gewalt und eine Entinstitutionalisierung der Kriegführung ein. Und das könnte die vorsichtige Arbeitshypothese dieser ganzen Ringvorlesung sein, die sich kritisch mit der hoffnungsvollen Erwartung liberaler Theorien auseinandersetzt. Der Krieg und die politische Gewalt könne durch einen Prozess fortschreitender Zivilisierung, Rationalisierung und Legalisierung gezähmt, geächtet und verboten werden. Ziel ist dabei nicht die Unmöglichkeit gerechter Friedensordnung und die Vergeblichkeit liberaler Weltordnungsmodelle zu behaupten, sondern die gegenläufigen Dynamiken und die politischen Widerstände deutlicher herauszuarbeiten, als es bislang getan worden ist. Was wir nämlich gegenwärtig sehen, ist auch die Bestätigung von zwei scheinbar widerstreitenden Vorhersagen über die Zukunft des Krieges. Die erste Vorhersage besagt, dass sich der Krieg in einen Konflikt geringer in, äh, Intensität verwandelt, das heißt in eine Art Krieg, in dem Guerillataktiken und Terrorismus gleichermaßen von nichtstaatlichen und staatlichen Akteuren angewendet werden. Staatliche Sicherheitskräfte, so wird behauptet, würden zunehmend irrelevant werden, weil die unkonventionellen Taktiken nichtstaatlicher Akteure, staatliche Strukturen und deren Kampfkraft untergeht, umgeht und untergräbt. Auf lange Sicht würde dann der Staat verblassen und von anderen kriegsführenden Organisationen abgelöst werden, was dann zu einer neuen Ära des globalen Bürgerkriegs oder des globalen War on Terror führen wird. Die zweite Vorhersage behauptet, dass der Krieg nicht nur transformiert, sondern durch die massive Einführung neuer Technologien in Kombination mit innovativen Organisationsformen revolutioniert wird. Die, die sogenannte Revolution in Military Affairs RMA, so wird argumentiert, garantiere einen schnellen und entschlossenen militärischen Sieg und verleihe denjenigen Ländern beispiellose Macht, die in der Lage und bereit sind, den technologischen Fortschritt optimal militärisch auszunutzen. Und beide Perspektiven sind irgendwie überzeugend, aber natürlich auch einseitig. Während sich die Theoretiker der Low Intensity Warfare auf die Motive der Schwachen und die Anreize für unkonventionelle Gewalt von nichtstaatlichen Akteuren konzentrieren, stützen sich die RMA-Protagonisten auf die Rationalität der Starken und die Bereitschaft der Staaten, den technologischen Fortschritt für militärische Zwecke zu optimieren. Beide vernachlässigen den Erfindungsreichtum, wenn sie so wollen, der anderen Seite und die Dynamik asymmetrischer Konflikte. Zwar sind Hightech-Kriegführung und Terroranschläge sehr unterschiedliche Formen asymmetrischer Gewalt, haben aber beide zwei Dinge gemeinsam. Erstens werden beide als Abweichung von zuvor etablierten Symmetriezuständen betrachtet 
Und zweitens werden beide Strategien häufig als Reaktion auf asymmetrische Herausforderungen gerechtfertigt, durch die eine grundlegendere Symmetrie zwischen den Opponenten wiederhergestellt wird. Und das ist also, glaube ich, diese Dialektik von Symmetrie und Asymmetrie, die die Zukunft der Kriegführung und der politischen Gewalt vermutlich bestimmen wird. Wie sich die Form politischer Gewalt verändern, wie, durch die tradition wie dadurch traditionelle Institutionen der Hegung des Krieges unterlaufen werden und wie sich das Verständnis von Gewalt und Ordnung transformiert, diese Fragen wollen wir äh, in den nächsten Jahren äh, hier untersuchen und zu einem gemeinsamen Forschungsschwerpunkt zwischen dem Exzellenzcluster Normative Ordnung der Goethe-Universität Frankfurt und der Hessischen Stiftung Friedens- und Konfliktforschung machen. Und die Ringvorlesung in diesem Semester dient uns dazu, in einen ersten Austausch mit hervorragenden Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern zu gelangen und diese Thematik fortzuentwickeln und zu schärfen. Das Programm liegt Ihnen vor und wir laden Sie ganz herzlich ein, an all diesen sechs Veranstaltungen äh, teilzunehmen. Heute findet mit Michael Mann der erste Vortrag statt. Und bevor ich Ihnen jetzt vorstelle, äh, gebe ich nochmal das Wort an Rebecca Schmidt, die auch noch etwas sagen wollte und im Namen des Exzellenzclusters äh, begrüßen wollte. Vielen Dank, lieber Christopher. Wir testen mal. Ich glaube, das Mikrofon funktioniert. Sehr geehrter Professor Mann, Lieber Christopher Dase, lieber Julia Jung, liebe Nicole Deitelhoff in Abwesenheit, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich möchte, oder da, ah, sehr geehrte, liebe Nicole, im Namen des Exzellenzclusters und zugleich im Namen der Direktoren Rainer Forst und Klaus Günther möchte ich Sie in der Tat ganz herzlich begrüßen zur Ringvorlesung des Forschungsverbunds im Wintersemester. Wie Christopher Dase gerade schon gesagt hat, sind die Ringvorlesungen die Veranstaltung, die innerhalb des akademischen Raumes die herausragenden Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler aus allen Teilen der Welt herbringen, um über die normativen Ordnungen zu reflektieren. Und mit Professor Michael Mann ist es heute natürlich eine ganz besondere Ehre und ein ganz besonderer Erfolg und großer Auftakt der Reihe im Wintersemester. Wie Sie vielleicht wissen, untersucht unser Forschungsverbund die gegenwärtigen sozialen Auseinandersetzungen, insbesondere um eine gerechte Ordnung der Gesellschaft in Krisenzeiten und wir schauen, wie diese normativen Vorstellungen kritisiert oder gerechtfertigt werden können. Die Fragilität der normativen Ordnungen, wie wir das neuerdings nennen und untersuchen werden, erscheint in der heutigen Zeit offensichtlich. Dazu hat Christopher Dase Ihnen schon in der Einführung hinreichende Worte gesagt. Wir versuchen zu reflektieren und hier weiteren Untersuchungen zuzuführen, wie tradierte Wertvorstellungen derart ins Wanken geraten können, wie internationale Zusammenarbeit nach Jahrzehnten auf einer Ebene derart in Umbruch geraten können. Und deswegen in der aktuellen Ringvorlesung fokussieren auf Krieg und politische Gewalt als Auseinandersetzung, als Mittel von Auseinandersetzung und Konflikten. Die Frage, ob die gängige Erzählung, wonach die Welt über lange Sicht immer friedlicher geworden sei, überhaupt noch haltbar ist und zutrifft. Die Transformation politischer Gewalt als Obertitel und die ähm, Zusammenhänge hast du erläutert. Ich möchte mich an dieser Stelle ganz herzlich bedanken bei den Organisatoren Nicole Deitelhoff in voller Anwesenheit, Christopher Dase und Julian Jung. Nicole Deitelhoff und Christopher Dase sind Mitglieder, Gründungsmitglieder des Exzellenzclusters und mit ihren Professuren also seit 2009 ein Teil des Forschungsverbunds und gleichzeitig die Leitung unserer Partnereinrichtung der HSFK, mit der wir gemeinsam im Forschungsverbund seit über zehn Jahren eng und bewährt zusammenarbeiten. Und als drittes Mitglied der Organisatoren von Dr. Julian Jürgen als Angehöriger der HSFK. Dass es diesen drei gelungen ist, mit Ihnen, lieber Herr Professor Mann, einen Forscher von Weltruhm heute gleich zum Auftakt zu uns zu holen, ist, wie gesagt, nicht nur ein besonderer Erfolg und ein Zeichen Ihrer guten Verbindungen und Ihrer wunderbaren Organisation. Und so ist es uns eine große Freude, die dritte Ringvorlesung aus dem Bereich Dase Deitelhoff innerhalb der letzten fünf Jahre hier gestalten zu können. Die Ringvorlesung im Wintersemester 13-14, Beyond Anarchy und dann die Ringvorlesung ähm, Angriff auf die liberale Weltordnung, die Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik in Zeiten von Trump erst im letzten Sommersemester. 
Christopher Dase hat noch kürzlich über die liberale Weltordnung auch im Rahmen unseres, das nennt man neudeutsch so, Public Outreads gesprochen. Und zwar in Offenbach. Wir sprechen also nicht nur in Frankfurt, sondern auch mit und über Offenbach. Dort haben wir über die Krise der liberalen Weltordnung gesprochen. Und wir werden auch in Zukunft wieder außerhalb dieser akademischen Formate über diese Themen sprechen, über den Zusammenhang, über den Konflikt, das für das Christopher Dase und Nicole Deitelhoff stehen, demnächst mal wieder auch in, wie gesagt, außeruniversitären Formaten, zu denen wir Sie herzlich einladen. Das können Sie alles äh, draußen sehen, zum Beispiel die Römerberg-Gespräche mit Nicole Deitelhoff, wo wir sehen werden, warum Demokratie Streit braucht. Und im Forschungsverbund, erlauben Sie mir diese eine Bemerkung auch noch kurz, befinden wir uns gerade in einem Transformationsprozess zu einem wissenschaftlichen Zentrum. In diesem Zusammenhang ist es besonders erfreulich, dass unser Antrag gemeinsam mit der HSFK und dem Fachbereich Gesellschaftswissenschaften auf die Gründung eines Bundesinstituts für gesellschaftlichen Zusammenhalt Erfolg hatte und deswegen die Goethe-Universität gemeinsam mit der HSFK in Kürze starten wird, unter der Leitung von Nicole Deitelhoff produktiven Streit auch in diesem Zusammenhang intensiv zu untersuchen, was auf all den Jahren der gemeinsamen Zusammenarbeit aufbaut. Jetzt also nochmal zurück zum übergreifenden Thema der heutigen Ringvorlesung und noch einen infrastrukturellen Vermerk, und das müssen Sie erlauben, oder das haben Sie erwartet wahrscheinlich von dieser Art Begrüßung. Wir arbeiten genauso auch zusammen im Projekt eines Leibniz Wissenschaftscampuses und da geht es um die gegenwärtigen Formen und die Formen und Transformationen politischer Gewalt, der hier widersprüchliche Trend, die Anzahl und die zwischenstaatlicher Kriege hat sich nicht signifikant erhöht, die Anzahl der innerstaatlichen Konflikte und terroristischen Attentate ist aber stark angestiegen. Diese Untersuchungen werden wir auch gemeinsam in Angriff nehmen. Auch dazu leistet die Ringvorlesung nach meinem Verständnis eine erste Grundlage und eine Erprobung der Themen. Soweit die Ausblicke innerakademisch und außerakademisch. Ich wünsche Ihnen jetzt im Namen des Exzellenzclusters einen spannenden und erkenntnisreichen Vortrag für heute und dann für die weiteren sechs Termine eine gewinnbringende Ringvorlesung. Die Liste der Vortragenden und Themen lässt auf jeden Fall darauf schließen. Und wie gesagt, die Organisatoren Deitelhoff Dase und jeder aus diesem Bereich sind jedenfalls ein Garant für eine spannende und hervorragend organisierte Veranstaltung. And last but not least, Professor Mann, it's a great honor for us and a great pleasure to have such an outstanding scholar with you here with us today to discuss these important, important issues. And I'm looking very much forward to you all. Oh, and there, there will be... Michael Mann needs no introduction, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it's uh, good practice to do it anyway. Um, Michael Mann is distinguished research professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles, as well as honorary professor at Cambridge University. He studied history uh, at the University of Oxford and made his PhD in sociology there. He worked at the University of Essex, Yale, and the LSE before he settled in California. Michael Mann is probably best known for his monumental four-volume opus magnum on the sources of social power. But equally important are his books on fascists or on the dark side of democracy uh, that analyzes the underlying causes of so-called ethnic cleansing. Michael Mann received many honors, the most recent one just a few days ago, the Friedrich Landshut Prize by the Hamburg Institute of Social Research. Michael, we are grateful that you came and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I'm afraid I do have to speak in English. I once knew some German, but ich habe alles Deutsch vergessen. Um, the question is simple, has war declined or not? And the predominant view in the social sciences for 250 years uh, has been either that it is declining or that it shortly will decline. <coughs> the 
In the Enlightenment in the 19th century, the view was that war was beginning to decline um, because of a variety of structures according to who the theorist was. Could be the rise of industrial society, uh, as it was for Saint-Simon, or capitalist society, including Marx, market society, democratic society. And of course, Kant held out the hope of perpetual peace, which he knew perfectly well was an ideal and not a reality. But the, the common element in this was that war would decline. Stressed by Monte, Montesquieu, Saint-Simon, Spencer, Marx, Mill, Ward, an American sociologist of the time. Uh, and they were responding to, uh, the, first of all, the notion that the basic structure of society was moving either to industry or capitalism or whatever, and these were inherently more peaceful. But also, they were responding to the post-1815 relative peace in Europe compared to its previous history. Europe, for about a millennium, had been probably the most warlike continent of any in the world. The only, in my calculations, the only one that resembles it was ancient China, in the period, basically in the period uh, before the common era. <coughs> but there didn't seem to be many wars. I know German, I know there were some wars in Germany, but that was unusual in, in, in Europe. <coughs> and of course, to come to that conclusion, they had to forget about colonial wars, which were more or less continuous, uh, especially uh, launched by the British, the French, the Dutch, and towards the end of the, cent uh, of the century, uh, Germany too. But they, they didn't count colonial wars. Uh, it's still to be noted that uh, the democratic peace theory never counts them either, uh, and nor do the uh, statistical uh, operations of, of uh, political scientists. Uh, <clears throat> now, there were some deviants, and the American war against Spain in 1898 produced Americans saying, uh, as Sumner did, man is addicted to war, and we will never get rid of it, unfortunately. And then in the run-up to the war, in the first year of the war, uh, there was a certain amount of German theory about how war would continue being a necessary part of great power relations. And indeed, for a short period at the beginning of the war, those theories I mentioned approved of it, though they didn't last out the term. <coughs> now, after 1918, it wasn't so much that uh, war was uh, discussed, and, uh, um, but rather that people ignored it. They preferred other more pacific tasks, and apart from, of course, the uh, fascist movements. And the same thing happened after 1945, when the two main theories of peace, that is liberal capitalism and state socialism, won the war and uh, proclaimed an era of peace. We had a Cold War, but a Cold War was uh, not something that gripped the population as a whole. And so once again, sociology and much of the political, of, of uh, social science neglected war. And though Marxists talked all the time about class struggle, they didn't mean actual fighting. And the Cold War was fought through proxies. Now, the end of the 1990s produced uh, a, a tremendous revival of the liberal op optimism. And these are uh, either American or Israeli names that you see up now, Mula, Gat, the Israeli, and Pinker, especially Stephen Pinker. 
And they talked about a really long-term decline in human history, not this dichotomous structure which the uh, 18th and 19th century theorists had seen, a shift from one social form which had dominated the whole of history before to another one. But rather, these uh, liberals saw a, um, a steady, or at least a continuous, decline in war throughout human history. Now, uh, we have to be grateful to Steven Pinker for having collected, he obviously had a large research team, collected so much data on wars, and so we have something to go on there and something to examine critically. And so I will concentrate on Pinker's data to begin with. What I will do in discussing whether war has declined or is likely to decline is to talk firstly about the long-term trends through to 1945, and then uh, the second part to talk about the world since 1945. <coughs> hmm. Now, there's first of all a considerable debate about early hunter-gatherer warfare whether there was any. Was the kind of confrontation between small um, uh, clan and tribal groups, was it a kind of bravado, as some so social anthropologists have described it, where the two groups shout at each other, perhaps hurl a spear or two, and then on a satisfied, they, they cease. And that's the image of hunter-gatherers and early agriculturalists uh, as Pacific. But writers like uh, Keeley um, have argued that they were extremely uh, warlike. And Pinker uh, uh, endorses this and says that hunter-gatherer groups could kill up to 60% of the population which is not the statistic you really want to know if there was just one case of 60% and the others were very low. And that 60% is obviously less than some of the genocides that we have known in the 20th century, which I then list. But most archaeologists and early historians say that the rise of the state, the rise of states brought more wars. Now, there's a tendency, um, both in the historical evidence itself and in the views of moderns about ancient societies, there's a tendency to exaggerate just how murderous they were. And they do this partly because such information we have on groups like the Assyrians they do boast, the Assyrian kings boast about wiping everybody out who opposes them. But in fact, what scholars have done in reconstructing the wars of the Assyrians and people like them is to show that what was going on was if they invaded another uh, state's territory, uh, and this applies also to the Mongols, um, uh, and they came across a city which resisted them, after they, uh, after they seized it, they destroyed the city and killed most of the people there. And this is taken as being typical. But it was not typical. It was what, we, what I call exemplary repression, where you are most murderous as an example to other cities. And the other cities, realizing how powerful the Assyrians and the Mongols were, come to terms with them. And so we have very exaggerated accounts of the, um, of the killing ratio of um, ancient peoples. Now, I hope you can all see that. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. It's a list of the wars, um, the conflicts, which produce the highest number of casualties, <coughs> of deaths, 
obviously these are very broad estimates in, uh, in almost all the cases. And if I start, you can see that the, they are listed uh, in the first column. The second column tells you what century this happened in. The numbers are in terms of millions dead. And you can see the first column after that is absolute death rate. It's an absolute, sorry, absolute number of deaths. And you can see that World War I, uh, sorry, World War II was the, um, the most murderous, followed by the deaths consequent uh, upon Mao's mistaken policies, with the Mongols in third place according to Pinker's estimate, and then uh, the fourth one uh, um, is the An Lushan well, it's a revolt, but a, a rival dynastic war in China in the 8th uh, century. And you go on, and you can see it's a bit of a mixture, and it wouldn't particularly support what Pinker is arguing, that that is, there is a long-term trend. And let me point out that the two in brackets in that column are my recalculations of the number of dead which reduces very much, well, they're not mine, they're the, they're the consequent scholars of these phenomena. Uh, and that reduces the Mongols from 40 million till to 11.5. That's bad enough, of course, but it would shift its position. <coughs> uh, and then the Andalusian revolt is the other one, which has to do with overestimating the population declined from the fact that the Civil War uh, produced a collapse of the imperial registration system. So they counted a much lower number of people after the revolt ended than were there before. But historians say that's mainly because the, um, uh, because the uh, registration system records were destroyed. <coughs> so firstly, it doesn't seem to support what Pinker is saying. But he then does something quite interesting. He says, well, this is a fairly meaningless statistic, the number of people killed. What you want is a relative rate. And what he does is calculate the relative casualties, that is, relevant, uh, relative to the population of the world at that time. Obviously, these are very crude estimates. And it's on that basis that he's able to get a, um, a, a list that looks more like what he's saying, a decline in a war. In his figures, you've got An Lushan and uh, the Mongols, uh, one and two, uh, followed by, well, the Middle East slave trade. Uh, and uh, the, the two world wars of the 20th century come down quite considerably in rank because the population of the world was, had been exp exponentially growing uh, for the previous century and continued to do so. And so that is the basis for his saying has been a decline in war. However, I've added another calculation, which is the duration of the war. After all, if you're comparing World War I four years, to the Mongol conquests a hundred years. The slave trade, these two slave tradings over s several centuries, well, in the case of the Middle East one, 12 centuries, then it, uh, it looks uh, less like it. And if we calculate um, the duration, uh, giving a annual death rate, then what we do, what the result is, we find that all the top ones are modern. World War II uh, returns again the top position. World War I is in second <coughs> position. The Taiping Rebellion, 19th century, is third. Now Tambolin, 
or Timur, who's given so many names in Western languages. Uh, 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 that is an older one, right? Um, and then Mao is number five. On balance, this tends to indicate that the 19th and 20th centuries are the most murderous that there have been. Uh, but there's another point to be made. Now, it, again, it's about the duration. How do you calculate the duration of the modern ones? You'll notice that what he does, uh, well, actually, I, his full table goes down to 21. Uh, but I can't fit all that on a, a table that you could read. Um, and out of that 21, <coughs> six of them are in the first half of the 20th century, and they're all connected in some way. World War I, World War II, obviously there wouldn't have been a World War II without World War I, the Russian and Chinese civil wars, and the Stalin and Mao killings plus famine. And they are six, and they are very close together in time, and they're plausibly all connected, as much as slave trade lasting over 12 centuries, even more so. So, Obviously, we know this already, you don't need me to say this, the first half of the 20th century is the most murderous period in the history of the world that we know of. And there is no secular decline. There's var variability through time and across regions. Um, this is what I've just been explaining. Uh, and indeed, war peaks in the 20th century. So the long-term argument uh, doesn't stand. Now, on the other hand, he has data on homicides. There's a long-term decline in homicide rates in Europe, Japan, and the United States. And of course, we don't have much dueling or public executions. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the, the countries of the, uh, that we call of, of the north of the world. And the internal cultures have been somewhat pacified, uh, as Elias somewhat equivocally uh, wrote. I mean, he. he he did say that uh, in his early work, but then when he wrote his book on uh, the Germans, he had to kind of change his uh, uh, tack a bit because, of course, by the Germans he meant the Nazis, and uh, that was rather reversed his civilizing process. Um, and others, including me, <coughs> talked about the growth of the infrastructural power of states, their ability to control and reduce uh, not crime rates, but reduce murder rates. Murder becomes the prerogative of the government. And so, indeed, uh, Pinker is largely right about the decline of homicide. <coughs> On the other hand, <coughs> there are plenty of very murderous cities in the world today. Uh, I compare them to, there are various figures for the 14th century in England, uh, including Oxford, where the rate is about 24 per 100,000 uh, murders. Oxford is especially interesting for an academic, because half of the murders are, uh, are committed either by students or by professors. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
Now, we attack each other savagely, but with words and not with daggers and the like. It, actually, if you know the, the television series set in Oxford of the, the, the policiers, Morse and, and Dever, and I don't know whether they're all shown over here in Lewis, uh, roughly calculating that murder rate, it's about the same, and half of them are committed by students or dons. Uh, so, uh, but that's in our imaginations. The reality is that if one person is murdered in Oxford in a year, uh, which has a population of about 100,000, uh, that's uh, somewhat surprising. <coughs> but there are plenty of cities in the world which have higher rates, and most of them are in Latin America, but there are four in the US. And Detroit and New Orleans are in the top 10 of, the, of world murderous, r murder rates. Now, Pinker somewhat dangerously says that this is a lagged civilizing process in the United States. Most of the murders, he says, are committed by African Americans. Well, that is distinctly politically incorrect, uh, but uh, <coughs> he says it, it's, um, it's the blacks and the South that are responsible for it, and we, we Northerners, uh, we're, we're, we're completely pacified. Okay. Well, I want at this point, <coughs> um, moving on to the period after 1945, to talk about uh, <clears throat> We're clearly talking about the period, the 70 year period since 1945. And there's obviously been, as everybody here knows, a, a major decline in the number of interstate wars. And war is no longer the backbone or the heart of many states. Most European countries now. Uh, the states do a lot of things uh, uh, more significantly and at more cost than they do war. And there are various causes of this, uh, which I then list. Um, war weariness, Europeans having killed 75 million of each other in the first half of the, uh, of the 20th century, got a little tired of war. And Europeans are now no longer from Mars, they're from the planet Venus, all loving. Second one is the end of empires, and Andreas Wimmer has shown that most uh, modern wars, if you just count each war as one, and you don't wait up World War I and World War II, most of the wars uh, uh, are colonial wars, uh, firstly of colonial conquest, and then of, uh, of um, colonial liberation. <coughs> Thirdly, we have nuclear weapons with, in English, we say uh, mutually assured destruction, MAD, M-A-D. I don't know if there's a German version of that. It obviously won't be MAD, but MAD works quite well. Uh, um, and the, the great powers of the United States and the Soviet Union clearly did show a great deal of restraint with one or two incidents where they might not have done, uh, but they devised a set of rules, like, for example, American and Soviet troops would never encounter each other. There would be proxy wars. You'd use others to do your, the, the fighting against communism or against capitalism. <coughs> And then more international re regulation, especially noticeable in Latin America, but also in, in Africa too. Very few uh, interstate wars. And where it gets close to them, there are uh, continental institutions which arise and which settle them. So um, disputes in Latin America have been solved by a, well, not solved. Um, mediated by a large number of different organizations, Latin American organizations, 
also by the Queen of England, by the Pope, and by the United States. So there's a, a lot of international regulation, and then finally, uh, there's a lot of, of uh, in, in, the, in the more pronouncedly global period, <coughs> a high level of international and transnational <coughs> interdependence. But of course, this decline in interstate wars has been balanced by a big rise of civil wars. From the 1930s <coughs> onward, the rise starts in the 1930s and continues through to the 1990s, and then there was a, a slight decline, and in that period, that's when these American liberals were writing their books or doing the work for their books, and there was a hope that civil wars were going to carry on declining. But of course, they didn't. They grew again from about 2010. And 2017 is the worst year so far for killings, the number of killings and the number of refugees, though that data on refugees has only been collected for about 20 years. <coughs> and of course, a massive growth in civilian casualties. However, the label civil war is misleading. Because they're almost all internationalized. Other powers, often the neighbors, but also the great powers far away, get involved in them. The Eastern Congo, interventions by nine African countries. Mali, France, and the Republic of Chad have been involved as well, plus American logistical support. As you go down the list, you see a lot of involvement by the US, but also by NATO. Uh, <coughs> the Yemen has been going, the civil war has been going on a long time, and it has shifted. The powers involved have somewhat shifted, but as we now know, this is uh, potentially the biggest uh, war going on, and it substantially involves not just the Houthis versus the formerly established government in uh, the Yemen, but also Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, the United States, Britain, <coughs> France, uh, Iran. Uh, <coughs> And Syria involves a large number of them, too. Okay. And there has also been foreign intervention against the armed religious groups who disturb the peace, who are, in a sense, civil wars, but they're of a different kind, like Al-Qaeda, uh, Daesh, or ISIS, uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, and the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. So there is a great deal of war going on that involves other powers than the neighbors. And it particularly involves the United States and NATO countries. Ah, you, you want me there. I gave this talk two weeks ago in France, and so I collected some French data, and these are all the green and the blue things are all uh, rounding, are all where French troops have intervened uh, with the numbers involved in them. Okay. So they're in mainly in two continents, Africa and uh, the French Antilles, the, um, uh, the Caribbean. Now, I think that when dealing with contemporary war, <coughs> that Collins, Randall Collins' particular typology is helpful. He distinguishes two main types of killing. And he says war in most of history was ferocious. It was hacking at bodies. You're, uh, you're there you know, directly by the enemy and you're trying to get at his body before he gets at yours. Uh, of course, they have archers as well, but it's mainly very short distance uh, body hacking. And 
the, the quality required is ferocity. It's the, the quality of, uh, of uh, boxers or wrestlers or um, where it, it, the speed and the force of the attack is what counts. And this is a, these were uh, uh, prized social virtues. A man who was ferocious uh, was a highly prized person. <coughs> but modern interstate war has become much more long distance, callous, without emotion. I'm not sure what the German word, uh, th there's no French word for callous, uh, so I have to say uh, without emotion. Um, the killing of unseen victims from a distance. In our wars, we in the northern countries, in the advanced countries, do not knife or shoot each other or hack at enemy bodies. And the kind of hacking that goes on uh, outside of battle horrifies us. So torture, rape, daesh, they all horrify us. But long-range bombings, uh, leading of course to drones, are all highly callous. That is, the killers are sit seated at uh, screens in Kansas or in Lincolnshire in England, and they are playing a computer game, which results in inflicting substantial casualties uh, a thousand miles away or further in the case of Kansas. <coughs> and they, they do actually see on the screen, they see the consequence of their bombing, but it doesn't seem to bother them. And it is rather like a computer game where you, you're constantly you know, <laughs> chopping off people's heads and things and it doesn't bother you because you know it's not for real. <coughs> uh, and, and simultaneously with this has come uh, the complete turn towards professional armies away from conscription there are still one or two European countries which have conscription but by and large they're countries that don't go to war um, <coughs> And so the war is conducted by this, these relatively small professional armies. There are a million four hundred thousand American troops out of a population of three hundred million. <coughs> and as I said, there, naught point seven percent of the US population have fought abroad in 21st century wars without any, a tiny proportion, without any real impact on American culture. <coughs> At most, this is what we might call spectator sport militarism, which is a kind of piece of jargon I invented when talking about the uh, Britain uh, Argentina war uh, about the Falkland stroke Malvinas Islands in 1982, <coughs> where everyone in Britain and presumably everyone in Ar Argentina as well uh, was focused on how our team is doing. And, uh, it's, uh, and we were sacrificing nothing, absolutely nothing. It's not like World War I and World War II when civilian populations uh, suffer a great deal. Uh, it, it's, it's like a game. It's a football match. Um, and uh, in general, you find, you know, if your local team is very successful, uh, that the attendance goes up and lots and lots of people go and watch them. But once they're in a trough, as Manchester United are now, I'm from Manchester originally, uh, <laughs> then fewer people go. So you, you support a winning team. And this is what's happened in Afghanistan and 
uh, Iraq, that it's gone largely out of the public consciousness because we weren't winning. We thought we were winning for a short period, but it's still going on. <coughs> so these are the reasons that turn to long distance callous war fought mainly by proxies, but with our high-tech assistance. <coughs> it's the reason why liberals think that war is declining. But it isn't. <laughs> now, th these are deaths in particular conflicts and it's looking at the proportion of the dead who are civilians. And, of course, this has been going steadily up. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the right-hand uh, <coughs> column, uh, it's the... Uh, it's a, um, a comparison of the estimates of total war deaths uh, and versus battle deaths. Uh, battle deaths means soldiers. And you see the proportions are all very low. Very few people killed in battles, very large number of civilians killed by the consequences of these wars, and some, sometimes massacred, but very often uh, starved. And. Uh, the worst one is, of course, the Congo. There are two estimates of the total dead in the eastern Congo. Uh, one is exactly double the other. One is uh, 2.6 million, and the other one is 5.2 million. I, I've gone for the conservative uh, uh, figure of reducing it slightly there. Uh, but if it was the... Uh, the the, the bigger figure would obviously the final figure would be three percent. So that these are really serious wars. These are wars that um, the if you take the 5.2 million uh, of the uh, estimate of the Congo, that would make the top 18 would be in 18th place in Pinker's list. Right. <coughs> but these are all very deadly wars. But again, they're a long way from us. Well, that's of no interest. This is world military expenditure, which has been, up, been going up in recent years. So a shift from ferocious to callous violence, it's not a total shift, of course, because uh, American troops in uh, Afghanistan are, are involved in a, in a short-range uh, confrontation uh, dealing with uh, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and anything. it's not really very callous. It's uh, much more directly experienced than that. But there is generally a kind of more indirect experience of war by northern countries as a whole. Okay. There's massive arms sales, of course, and massive profits. There's <laughs> war through proxies, and there's interventions far away. So this uh, reinforces the decline in homicide to produce what is a pacified culture. Right? I mean, Germany is very pacified. Yeah, I know that Germany is not much involved in, in, in these interventions because of what happened in its recent history. Uh, but uh, the same is true of uh, Britain, France, and to a little lesser extent the United States because of the, uh, the frequency of the use of guns in the United States. <coughs> and the wars become barely visible. And this is why many people believe that wars are declining. Okay. Um, there are still, as there have always been, big regional variations. 
and I would hesitate to make a kind of prognostication of the kind that uh, Pinker and the others do, because regional variation is the most important thing going on in, in every century, really. Um, first half of the 20th, 20th century, world wars, Eurasia ravaged, but the American continent, Latin America, virtually no wars at the same time. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, all, um, medieval and early modern Europe, very warlike, medieval and modern, if you can use those terms, China, uh, not so much, apart from a struggle against barbarians in the north, but the relations with other states in the southeast and south of Asia were pretty peaceful. And again, today we have particularly dangerous regions. The Middle East is one where there are wars of a su substantial uh, uh, nature in which we have heavy involvement. Uh, Africa has a large number of civil wars, but other parts of the world are pretty peaceful. Latin America again, uh, Western Europe itself. <coughs> Well, what about the future? Well, nobody can really say what's going to happen, especially with these possible scenarios. Uh, it is always possible that a nuclear war could break out. And uh, I think luckily for the world, Trump is not only a bully, he's a coward. So he tends to back down uh, when faced with another bully. Uh, and, um, so far, human beings have managed to live with nuclear weapons, apart from the first use of them, uh, and let's hope that that continues. But the uh, problem of the Middle East, uh, if Iran does go towards them and get them, well, Sa Saudi Arabia will too. and. Uh, uh, and perhaps one or two other states as well in the region. And once you get beyond a two-power confrontation, things become more dangerous. Two-power confrontation, you can see the, uh, the potential enemy directly, and you can kind of plan a response, and the two of you together can implicitly um, divide <coughs> rules. If you have five or six, well, then you have the kind of situation of the, of the outbreak of the First World War, where they can't, there's too many of them, they can't predict what each other are going to do, they get decisions badly wrong. <coughs> the other problem is the US-China confrontation, which is obviously taking place before our eyes now with the trade war, <coughs> and with the expansion of Chinese military into the Pacific, uh, and the apparent unwillingness of the United States to let China have a role as a regional hegemon. So who knows what will happen there. And then there's the possibility of environmental wars, which is becoming more and more likely. I say that because it's becoming more and more likely that climate change will produce major crises for many countries in the world and massive refugee flows, tendency of more favored states to build walls around itself and resist uh, immigration, and uh, who knows what wars could develop from that. <coughs> so in conclusion, the liberals were wrong, poor old Kant is no closer to being re realized, and uh, war is certainly not abolished and it's currently getting worse. Thank you. <laughs>